more features. That's what this nugget is all about. We're going to pick up right after Voice Productivity Features Part 1 and start adding more features to our abilities with CME. We'll take a look at intercom, paging, after hours call blocking, setting up music on hold, and last but not least, turning on the CME graphic interface or web based GUI. Which, well, sis, I will say Cisco has consistently kept their record with the quality of their graphic interfaces on that one. <laughs> I'll explain that when we get to it. But for now, I'm going to start off this one just like I did the previous nugget. Some of these features are so simple and straightforward that I'll configure them right here on this title slide. Others will get their own information and need a little digression before we can set them up. So, start off with intercom. Intercom is a feature that allows you to configure a direct link between, typically, an assistant phone and a manager phone to where you can have an assign directory button on both so phones that if one needs to get a hold of each other it actually will dial the manager number and the manager's phone will automatically answer on speakerphone so it's kind of like an immediate you know two-way radio to where I can you know click the button and go hello you're there and the other person immediately hears it you've seen those cell phones I think it's a Nextel that has that uh, the cell phones that work like walkie-talkies that's kind of what this intercom feature is all about so to set up intercom, we need to, as always, define more ePhone DNs. Now, there's a slight catch when we do this configuration, so pay attention closely as we look at it. I'm going to go into the. I'm still got my pickup groups from the previous video. Let me clear this off. I'm going to the CME router, into global configuration mode, and I'm going to configure ePhone DN, and we'll just do 30. And this is going to be my intercom. Now on the number, here's here's the catch. I'm going to make the number. We'll make it a 100. Now looking at that, it might seem like that's not a number. Well, you're right in the sense that it isn't a number that's dialable from any phone. See, here's the idea with intercom. We're going to essentially make these two phones talk, and I'm going to have. I mean, the intercom broken down straightforward is saying this one has a number, we'll say it's 100, and this one has a number that's 101, and all it's going to be is a phone number that auto dials 101 when I hit it, and this one will auto answer on speakerphone. And that, that'll be how intercom works between these two phones. But I don't want to assign it a phone number that's dialable by just anybody in the network, because if I did, somebody could misdial and then automatically end up on speakerphone with a manager. You don't want that. So by assigning it a phone number of A100, or you could even do ABCD as a phone number, it prevents somebody from dialing it from their phone. This is not one of those things where, you know, on the telephone keypad, A, B, C is the two key, D, E, F is the three key, and so on. This isn't something like that, where this is actually the digit two. This is really the letter A, which is not dialable from a telephone. So I'm going to give this phone A100. And let me put some notes here on the whiteboard, just so we can keep all the numbers straight. We'll give this one A100, which will make this the assistant. And over here, we'll make this one the manager. Okay, so we have a manager and his assistant that is going to be having an intercom between them. So A100 is the assistant. And now I'll come back over here and say this one uh, will be an intercom and it will automatically dial. It'll auto call, as that context sensitive help says, A101, which is the manager's number. And the label that we'll give it on the telephone will be. Let's just say manager. Okay, it says use quoted string if including spaces. I'm not having spaces, but I'll put it in quotes anyway. So A101 will be labeled on the phone manager. Now, I'll exit out of here and I'll talk about some of these other uh, options that come up here. Those are some nice options. Um, I'm going to go into, <laughs> they're very nice, uh, ePhone DN31, and we'll say number will be A101 and we'll make this one an intercom as well and we'll say it's an intercom that will speed dial A100 and we'll label that one assistant okay so now I've created the two intercom lines now I just need to assign them 
I'm going to go to ePhone. Uh, let's go to ePhone 3 because that's the one sitting right next to me. And I'm going to say the button, the button 4, because I've got three lines on there right now, button 4 will be ePhone DN30. That's going to be the assistant phone because uh, ePhone DN30, I gave number 100, and it's going to intercom, it's going to speed dial the manager. Um, th and then I'll exit out of here. I'll say, well, hey, let me go back under there and restart that guy. And I'm going to do ePhone 4, and we'll do button, well, no, sorry, not ePhone 4. I'm going to do ePhone 5, which is my IP communicator. And I'm going to go into ePhone 5, and we'll do button 2. So that's the second button on there, will be ePhone DN31. So this, this right here is going to be the manager phone. So now I'll restart that one. It'll flash back up there. And notice, it now has an assistant button there. Now, at this point, I can, my other phone is a 7970, so it's rebooting as I speak. Uh, I can hit this button and speed dial the assistant. The assistant's phone automatically answers on speakerphone, and it, it shows right on the screen. It says, from manager. As a matter of fact, so you can see it. I hung up the other one. I'm going to hit the button here and dial the manager from the assistant's phone. Now, you can see immediately this comes on. It says, from assistant. It's an intercom. It's auto-answered to speakerphone. Now, you can see down here the speakerphone button is lit, but notice as well the mute is automatically on. So in the intercom feature, it automatically mutes the phone when you hit intercom so that the assistant doesn't accidentally hit the manager, hear the manager saying something. I mean, the manager could be in a meeting. The manager could be on the phone with, with uh, some, well, I guess it wouldn't be the IP. But he might be on a cell phone with somebody talking about some personal stuff. You don't want the assistant to suddenly hear everything that he's saying. Now, you might notice some of the options. Uh, let me go back under the ePhone DN. Um, when I do the intercom uh, A100, when I threw the question mark after that, you saw some of the options in here. Uh, for instance, barge in. Uh, as of right now, if the manager is on the phone and the assistant tries to, to barge in, it will show, hey, there's a call from A100 ringing, but he will still be on his active call. It's not going to interrupt his active call to take the assistant's intercom unless I put barge in. Bargin will automatically put the manager's call on hold and then flip over to the assistant's intercom. Uh, I don't know about that one because as a manager, I'd want, sure, I'd want to see my assistants trying to page me or intercom me, but I wouldn't want it to interrupt an active call. Uh, no auto answer. I'm actually not too sure what the point of this one is. No auto answer would mean that the assistant would hit the button, but it would just show ringing here. It wouldn't actually show uh, it going on speakerphone muted. Now, the reason I say I'm not too sure of the point of that one is because that's the same as a speed dial. I might as well assign a speed dial to the manager and assistant phone so they could speed dial each other, and then it wouldn't auto answer. So, uh, not too sure why that's there. Uh, down here we have no mute. That is if, I mentioned before, when I hit the intercom, it automatically goes on speakerphone muted. If I wanted it to be unmuted, meaning you immediately have a two-way conversation, I would follow this up with no mute. So it goes just on speakerphone and does not mute the call. So that is how we can create an intercom between two devices. Now we move into paging. Paging is an option that allows you to send a group announcement to one, two, a group, or all Cisco IP phones that are in your network. Uh, this is typically something that's geared for small businesses because in large enterprise organizations, you don't usually, I mean, you have thousands of phones, you don't usually have somebody who announces to the whole organization uh, what's going on. So, ironically, the full version of Call Manager doesn't support paging. It's kind of one of those features that people have wanted from the full uh, call manager versions, but it's never been there. It's actually Cisco outsourced it to a, I shouldn't say outsourced, but uh, there's a third-party company called Burby, B-E-R-B-E-E, uh, -E -E, that came up with a add-on paging solution for uh, call manager, the full version. So it's, it's kind of funny that it's supported natively in CME, the smaller version, but the real call manager doesn't support it. 
Anyhow, it is a one-way speakerphone based announcement, meaning that when you page, you have the person who is uh, talking on the, the phone up here, this is my little phone, you speak into the phone, and it pages all these phones in the paging group on speakerphone. They cannot talk back to you. It is a one-way audio announcement. The way you set this up is by creating a paging number and assigning groups or IP phones to a paging number. So for example, I might say 5510 is my paging number, meaning if I wanted to page those phones, I would dial 5510, all the phones would immediately go boom, you know, and you could say your announcement and it would page that group. Now, each IP phone can be assigned to only one paging number. I can't have these in multiple paging groups, which seems like a bummer until you find out that Paging groups can be associated with what's called parent paging groups. I think that's a word I just came up with because that's, that's how it makes sense. But I could, for instance, have paging group 510 or 5510 for these three phones, paging group 5511 for these three phones, and then paging group 5512, which is a kind of parent group number that pages both of these paging groups, thus giving me one phone number or one paging group that I can page everybody with. Now, CME supports, this paging feature supports unicast or multicast mode. What that means is I can, when, when paging is configured, have the CME router send a unique message to everybody. So say I'm, I'm dialing this, I went to page 5510, and there's three phones that are a member of 5510. CME can send a unique audio stream to all three phones that's known as unicast paging, or it can send one stream that all three phones receive, which know, is known as multicast paging. Now, multicast paging is hugely more efficient than unicast because sending one message for a group of phones is, takes much fewer or much less resources on the CME router than sending an individual message for each one of these phones with, with unicast. The catch with multicast is that you have to set up your network to support multicast or else it's treated, a multicast packet is treated like a broadcast and that it goes everywhere flooding the whole network and that's definitely not efficient. So if your network supports multicast, whoa, uh, then, then, I'm, then I'll say go ahead and use it. Definitely go forward with that. But if it only supports unicast and does not support multicast, then, then that's the way you're going to go. Setting up multicast on a network is not hard. It just has to be done, and there's a lot of networks that, that don't do it. One catch to the whole multicast thing. Since unicast can be so processor intensive, since the CME router has to send individual streams to each phone, if you are using unicast paging, CME will limit you to 10 phones in a paging group. If you want to go beyond 10 phones, you need to go and convert to a multicast configuration. So, here's how we can set up paging groups. I'm going to go into, well, let me get out of the intercom mode. Uh, once again, I'm going to define another ePhone DN. I'm in the 30s, so let's uh, create ePhone DN 32. That's where I left off. Now, underneath this ePhone DN, I'm going to give it the paging number. So, I'll say the paging number will be. Let's see, 5510, 5510. Now once I've done that, I just need to follow that up with the command paging. And that immediately tells CME that this is not a normal phone number, this is a paging number. So now I need to assign the phones to the proper paging group. Now sitting right next to me, I have the phone uh, ePhone 1, which is sitting next to me. And I'll say the paging DN for this phone is 32 thus saying you are a member of group 5510. Now remember, each ePhone can only be assigned to one paging group. So I'll also say ePhone 3, that's the other one sitting right next to me, uh, that one is assigned to the paging DN32 as well. So now, when I go to my phone here and dial, I'll do a new call and do 5510, I go on to, wow, I got some echo going on here. Uh, I'm going on to paging mode, and I don't know if you can hear it. Let me, well, I don't know what the point of this would be. Whoa! I'm um, getting feedback, but I, I now have both phones sitting next to me on paging.
and I am paging both of them from this phone. So I've disconnected that now. And that is, that is configuring basic unicast paging. Now, if you did have your network configured to support multicast, which is beyond the scope of this series, but again, it's not too bad, um, all you would have to do is go underneath the paging number that you've set up, in this case, ePhone DN32, and I would say paging, just like I did before, but instead of pressing enter, I would say the IP that I'm going to use for paging is... And I would type in the multicast address that I would use. Uh, now, the way multicast works is when I type in the address, and by the way, multicast is considered a class D address. So it begins from, well, let's see, class C goes through uh, 192 all the way up through 223. So multicast begins from 224 and continues on from there until the class E range. So I might define a multicast address of, we'll say, 239.1.1.100 as my multicast paging IP. Um, I'll then say the port that I'm going to use to page is 2000. That's actually the default port or the normal port that phones listen to uh, for their skinny messages and hit enter. So now I'm using multicast for my paging system and it would work the same way. It's just my network has to be configured to support multicast. Now just just so you, you catch how this multicast feature works. Multicast is kind of like a radio frequency like if you've gone into your car right and you've you've uh, let me get this out of here uh, you're driving in your car you might tune into a radio station we'll say you know here's my little car uh, I tune in with my little antenna to 105.5 and I'm listening to that radio frequency here as as I drive now I, I'm you could kind of say I'm assigned that radio frequency and that my my car is tuned into it but there may be a, another car just down the road from me and we'll say that is a truck that is also tuned in to 105.5 we're tuned into the same frequency and we're, we're listening to that same radio station well multicast works the same way when I set up a multicast group these phones kind of tune in to that radio frequency we'll say 239.1.1.100 now they're all assigned that IP address but I, I assigned is almost too strong of a word because you think oh well you can't assign them all the same IP address because that's a conflict right well with multicast they are assigned that IP address or they're how about they're listening to that IP address because that IP address is kind of their radio frequency so now when the router sends a message, it doesn't send them all individually to each IP phone, to each IP address, but it sends it to the radio frequency of 239.1.1.100. So all the phones that are tuned into that or that multicast group will all hear that announcement and page it even though the router is only sending one message. That's kind of how multicast works. So that's the base configuration of paging. Let me step it up a notch. Let's say that we've got two groups. Let me get all this out of here. Uh, 5510, which I just created. I assigned uh, 1001 and 1003, the, uh, or the, e I should say, ePhone 1. Let me get a little more specific. ePhone 1 and ePhone 3 are assigned to that paging group, as you can see right there. Let's say I want to create a second paging group. I'll do ePhone DN 33, and we'll say the number will be 5511, that's the second paging group. And I'll say this is also a paging number. And I'll go into ePhone 2 and say your paging DN is 33 and ePhone 4. So I've got 1 and 3 assigned to paging DN uh, 32, uh, 1 and 4 with 32, that's my 5510. And then, here I'll just write it right here, a little clearer than the syntax. 1 and 3 go into this one, and I'll make ePhone, D, ePhone 2 and ePhone 4 go into group 33. So I'll just hit the up arrow, do ePhone 4, and do paging DN 33 for that. So now I truly do have two separate groups. One pages these two phones, the other pages these two phones. Now, what if I wanted to create that parent group? Remember I said we could do like a 5512 that then pages to group you know, 30, 32 and 33 or 5510 and 5511 at the same time, thus giving me company-wide paging. The way I would do that is I would go and create a third 
ePhone DN. I'll do ePhone DN 34. And I'll say the number for this one will, not name, how about number, will be 5512. This will be my, my parent number right here. That's going to page the 5510 and 5511 be below it. Now what I need to do is associate these paging groups. You can kind of say these lower level paging groups, if you will, like 33 and 32, with the paging group, the parent paging group, 34. I know it kind of sounds confusing when I'm saying it because I'm kind of alternating between the number and the ePhone DN number. But the way I associate this is by saying paging group and I'll say this this is going to link up to um, 32 and 33. Enter. Oh, sorry. I have to say this is paging. This is a paging number. Then assign it to the paging group 32 and 33. Uh, so now it says 5512 is used for paging. And when I page it, when I dial that number, I'll bring that up here, 5512, and hit dial, it automatically pages all of the different phones that are in my network. Now, I don't know if you can hear the echo bouncing around my room right now, but all, all four phones, or I have five, but four phones are actively talking at the same time. Now, it does give the person who is paging a ring before they're actually talking to everybody, so that way they have time to prepare themselves uh, when, when they dial the number. They're not immediately just going to say, okay, everybody, I'm, I'm paging right now. So um, they will have like a second of prep time. So that is configuring paging. Now before we move on to after hours call blocking, I have some exciting news to share with you. I just had a delivery arrive for me that was an item I bought off eBay, which is this. Woohoo! My new laptop is here. I actually have been waiting for this for quite some time. I, I, uh, this is a Dell... D400, Latitude D400, which if you look up D400, it's nothing special. You're not going to be like, whoa, that is the best laptop ever. It actually is an old laptop. I don't even know if they make it anymore. I got it for $200. But the key to the D400 is this guy was $200. Did I, did I say that? It's 3.7 pounds, which is really small. It's 12 inches, little 12 inch screen, and it has a built in serial port. This is going to be perfect. I'm so excited. This is going to be perfect for when I'm, uh, when I'm configuring Cisco devices in uh, a rack in you know, an IT room or, or something like that. You know, I've, I've always been using my Macintosh. I have one of those MacBook Pro 17 inch you know, killer laptops. It was, it was my Christmas present a couple years ago, and I love it. I'm not going to say I, I don't like it. I love it. It's great, but it's huge. I mean, any, anywhere I go, I'm like, oh, uh, scoot that aside. Excuse me. Let's, yeah, let's move that away. I've got my massive laptop. Top, which you know everybody's like okay you know that's that's a little big it's 17 inches it's massive so anyway I'm I'm really excited this thing is so tiny and the key the reason I went with this guy I don't know if you've seen them they actually um, uh, Asus I, I was really debating uh, Asus makes this thing called an EEE -E -E PC that's that's the name of it it's tiny I mean and it's like four hundred dollars but it's like you can slip it in your pocket. It can even run Windows XP and everything. But it, it, it uh, doesn't have a serial port, so you have to use one of those USB to serial adapters to get your console cable. Those things are just a pain. I know some of you use them. I've used them on my Mac for years. But I just, I just keep, they're just a pain. So anyway, exciting news. I'm, I'm excited. So I'm sure as soon as I'm done with this video, I'm going to go play with my 12-inch laptop. I'm excited about it. So after hours call blocking is a feature that a lot of companies are looking for to block calls after number after hours uh, this is you know sometimes they have janitorial staff that comes in after hours makes international phone calls or you know employees that stay late to do this kind of thing so there's there's a goal to stop people from calling uh, it, you know, banned numbers, whether it's long distance, maybe it's even dialing out to the PSTN uh, during an after hours time frame. And it could be, you know, whatever time frame you define. Now, Cisco routers have long since been able to do this f through something called core restrictions, which stands for class of restriction. Uh, the problem is core restrictions, I mean, they're part of the CCVP track, and it literally takes me about two, maybe three nuggets to talk about how to completely set these up, because they're really complex. So 
with CME, they wanted just a simple way to block calls after hours that you know, wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be allowed. So the basics of this syntax, I'll get into the basics, then I'll talk about, you know, phones can be exempted and all that kind of things. But um, let me, I just read one of my bullets, which I'll have to add on to in just a moment. But uh, let me bring my e-phone or CME router up here. And clear all this stuff off the screen. So I'm on my CME router. I'm going to go under the telephony service configuration mode to configure this. And the general syntax to configure after hours call blocking is first off to define what is after hours. So I'm going to type in after hours and do a question mark. And you can see we have block where I choose the patterns. But I'm, I need to define the dates and times that this is going to be blocked. So I'm going to say the day will be uh, let's do Monday, and this is you know real basic system of setting it up. Time to start, we'll say is going to be 5 p.m. because that's when everybody goes home. 5 p.m. on the dot, and the time to begin, you know, or or I guess you could say that uh, end where the after hours time blocking ends will be 8 o'clock a.m. So this is military time. So I'm saying 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. is the range on Monday. Now I'm going to just use the up arrow to define that for Tuesday. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So we'll say during the during the week those are defined. Okay, so any any time during the week uh, after hours, and you could do weekends, you know, from zero hours to twenty four. So nothing is allowed on the weekends. You could go uh, to that, but you can also do things like this. I could say, you know, after hours date you see that up there and I'm gonna say December uh, December 25th which is Christmas no one should be in the office on Christmas so I'll say from uh, z whoops I just click to the slide uh, zero hundred hours I'll do zero zero two zero zero which means you know the entire day from start to finish uh, I'm going to have an after hours time frame defined and you could do this for New Year's for Thanksgiving whatever days your company would consider off hours so now after you've defined your time and date ranges that you would consider after hours you need to say what patterns would be blocked uh, what what numbers are you not allowed to call so I'm gonna say after hours block and you can see we have pattern here. What pattern would you like to block? And you can block up to 32 different patterns. I'll say pattern one is, now it says word. Now, I'm primarily going to talk about these patterns when we get to dial peers, because this is what we define to access the public switch telephone network. But I mentioned a, a little earlier um, in one of the previous nuggets that, for instance, the dot wildcard, when I say dot, that equals any digit so <laughs> as I just scribble uh, so the the pattern of we'll say four dot 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 would be considered a four digit extension that begins with four and has three digits long so four thousand one would match that four nine one one would match that you know all these different numbers would match that pattern so if I'm going in to say well here's what I would block here's a good pattern I would say when somebody dials 9, if 9 is what I dial to get an outside line, and a 1, and then we'll say dot, 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 there's my area code, dot, 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 there's the first three digits of the number, dot, 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 enter, that represents a long distance number. So any long distance number is considered a blocked pattern. I could then, you know, go further and, you know, we could get specific on this and say I want to block one nine hundred numbers if you want to you know block well I, I just overwrote my pattern uh, pattern one is that we'll say pattern two blocks nine hundred numbers now that's an overlap with the one above so nine hundred numbers would be blocked by this I'm just trying to give you some examples and remember all of the patterns that I'm typing in here is based on the North American numbering plan, which I know many of you are out of the country that, that listen to these uh, videos and, and things like that. So use 
your own numbering scheme wherever you are and choose what numbers you would like to block after hours. Now, when, when we get into dial peers in just a few nuggets from now, I'll also show you some other patterns that you can use that, you know, if I want to block, like in, in America, when I dial uh, 9011, that represents international numbers, not just long distance. If I want to block all international numbers, I could actually follow that up with a T which is kind of a universal dial anything wildcard. So there are many wildcards that we could use, but my point is that we are just defining all these patterns that we can block. And this is, you know, automatically blocked, oops, after hours, when anytime we go into those date and time ranges before. Now, there may be times where I want to exempt phones. I can, you know, you can see my lines here phones can be exempted either always or through pin numbers so maybe there's a manager phone who commonly works late uh, and I say you know what he's just his phone is just always exempted if I want to do that I all I need to do is go to the phone itself we'll say ePhone one is my exempted phone and I'll say after our exempt enter Okay. This phone is automatically exempted from any after hours restrictions that have been defined. Now there's an exception to that rule, you know, an exempted exception. I'll show you that in a moment, but for now, you know, this this phone after hours can dial any of these numbers that I've defined. Now, I'll exit out as well and show you another way. Let's say ePhone 2, I want that phone to have the ability to be exempted, but it's not automatically exempted. I can do that by assigning a PIN number to that phone. Let's say 1234. Enter. What that does is now, after hours, before this person is able to, to call blocked patterns, they would have to enter this specific PIN number. And I can do that for every phone. I can either give them the same PIN number if everybody's using you know, the same PIN to dial in, or I could give them different PIN numbers. It's, I would probably do the same, just so I wouldn't have to keep reminding users of their PIN number. I just say, you know, everybody can use the PIN. Any legitimate employee can use the PIN 1234 after hours to make calls. Now, in order to do that, the user's going to have to log in to the phone. Um, so the way that uh, the way that they do that is by pushing a login button uh, on the phone that will not be available. The the button will not appear until I go under the telephony service and type in login and you know hit the question mark and you can see I can just hit enter to require logins, meaning the phone after hours will need a login uh, where they type in their PIN number to get uh, access to these patterns. Uh, or, you know, I could just hit enter and that would be it. Or I can say the timeout is going to be, we'll say, 120 minutes. And I'm going to clear the, the uh, exemption at 2,300 hours. So here's what that means when I hit enter. That means when somebody logs in, if somebody logs in and using their PIN number to the phone, uh, they will remain logged in for two hours or 120 minutes before the phone automatically logs them out and they have to re-log in uh, by typing in their PIN number to dial a long distance number. Now I also included this clear, which is another option. I could say clear the login at 2300 hours, which is 11 o'clock p.m. if you use a.m. and p.m. time. Um, so at 11 p.m., maybe they logged in at 10.30, uh, you, they're going to be kicked out, meaning they have to re-log in at 11 o'clock because I clear all logins. Because usually, I might say at my company, people don't just work that late. They all go home by that time. So at 2300, they're automatically logged out. Now, a couple of questions might pop into your mind when you see that. You might think, well, what if somebody's on the phone and they pass 11 o'clock at night? Does it automatically hang up? No, it doesn't. It, it just, you know, as soon as they hang up the phone, they're going to have to re-log in to get access to the uh, long-distance dialing capabilities one more time. So that's the, uh, the capabilities that we have there. Uh, now, let's see, what else was I going to say? Oh, right here. It says 24-7 blocked patterns are never allowed. What that means is that I have some patterns that I can define as always blocked. These are not after-hours patterns. These are things that I'm going to say, you know what, anytime, uh, anytime I want one of these phone numbers blocked, they're always blocked. There is no exemption to this. So here's what I would do for that. Um, I could do after-hours block, and I defined one of my patterns. Uh, we'll do pattern... 
Pattern three. I think I did the one nine hundred before, so I'll do uh, one nine hundred numbers. Now in the United States, one nine hundred numbers are bad. They are the ones that they can immediately bill you, you know, fifty bucks or two dollars a minute or whatever the the company uh, wants to bill you, and they're usually not very reputable numbers. I'll leave it at that. So I might want to say, you know, one nine hundred numbers dot dot dot. They're always blocked dot 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 dot. So that's that's a typical 1900 extension format or phone number format. Um, I, there is no exception. Before hours, after hours, whatever. I can include the 724 keyword after it, and now this number will never be able to be dialed from any phone. There is no exception. So that is how we can set up after hours call blocking. All right, now we can move into our last two features. And man, these these features are taking me longer to talk about than I thought. Sorry for the uh I know the productivity feature part 1 and this one's going to be a little longer for the nuggets. Sorry for the uh extra time. I'm sure talking about my new D400 Dell laptop helps a lot, but um let's talk about these last two features and then we'll wrap things up. Music on hold. They're quick. Music on hold is a capability that allows you to stream a WAV file or AU file stored in a router's flash memory as music on hold. Now, there are no music on hold files that come with the CME router or the CME software you download from Cisco. Uh, Cisco does have a music on hold pack that they have available for uh, call manager, the full blown thing. And, and if you have rights to the Cisco CCO, you have a SmartNet contract, you can download that. And the, the benefit is those are all Cisco approved, not Cisco approved, but Cisco compiled non-copyrighted music. Meaning you can install that and play it without violating any uh, license agreements. If you, at least in the United States, if you stream copyrighted music, like, you know, grab your favorite artist and, and convert, you know, using iTunes or whatever utility you use, convert their CD into WAV files, and then play those, the FCC considers that broadcasting. So you can be fined heavily if somebody finds out you're playing that as your music on hold without paying broadcasting permissions, almost like a radio station, uh, to, to, to stream that. So... The first thing to do is get some uncopyrighted WAV or AU files and get them into the router's flash. So what I've done is I've got my little TFTP server set up here. And I'm going to go to, let me just tuck that guy right there. I'm going to go to my router. I'm going to type in copy TFTP to flash. And the address will be 172.16.1.50, I believe. Hang on, let me... Yes, 172.16.1.50 is my TFTP server. The source file name is matchbox20.wave, <laughs> which is a copyrighted band, but this is only for demo purposes only. Destination file name, matchbox20. It double checks to make sure it's there and copies the file over. So this is a little matchbox20 file. Now when I do a dir of my flash, I can see that matchbox20 is now sitting in flash as my music on hold. So I'm now going to go to the telephony service config mode, hit enter, and the command is simple. All I have to do is do MOH, music on hold, and it says what, what uh, word do you want? What is the file name that represents your music on hold in Flash? So I'll say it is matchbox20.wave and hit the enter key. So this can stream any WAV file or AU, that's another uh, audio format. Oh, wait a sec. It does come with Call Manager Express, CME. The new CME versions do have it. Um, look at that. It's right there. I'm staring right at it. Music on hold.au. That is a little sample music on hold file that you could use. As a matter of fact, let's, let's uh, take my copyrighted music demo out of there and let's, let's just throw uh, the, mu the one that comes with it, music on hold.au, uh, in as the music on hold file. That will now be the one that's streamed. Now, that if, if you're using Unicast for music on hold, that's it. That's all you, all you need to do. Same limitations though as paging. Uh, you can only do 10, 10 people on hold at the same time because it can eat up your uh, resources. But the, you can also do this multicast. I could say uh, multicast MOH. And again, just like we did with the paging system, you would define your address. We'll do 239.1.1. We'll say 55. Uh, port and you know choose a port number that it's going to stream. We'll just say uh, 2100. 
And that will be what it streams to now as music on hold. So it will actually send that out as a music stream. So now all the phones, when, you, when they put each other on hold, will start streaming that music. Uh, so this does support unicast, multicast. It does support uh, uncompressed or compressed codecs. We're going to talk about the codecs later on. Uh, but I will warn you, music on hold does not sound that great when you compress it using G729. More on that when we talk about the codecs. Um, and this last bullet, I shouldn't word it like this. Uh, don't get caught playing copyrighted stuff. I should just say, don't get caught. Or no, I should say, don't play copyrighted stuff. Uh, because that's, as I mentioned, very uh, finable by the FCC. Oh, one more thing. I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to play the, the, the music that comes with CME, just so you could hear what it sounded like. It's actually, it's not too bad. Cisco used to provide some pretty horrific music uh, as the default. But I'm just going to uh, start a call, throw it on speakerphone over here, and uh, put it on hold so you can hear it. Not too bad. So you got a little, you know, a little piano solo going on there. So, you know, I'm very comforted by that music. I feel very calm after the uh, after the music. So it, it, you could just use that one built into the flash if that suits you just fine. All right. The last feature that we're going to turn on is the CME GUI, the graphic user interface that allows you to manage some features of CME through a web page. Now, if you've seen Cisco graphic interfaces in the past, most of them have not been that impressive, and some have been very bad. Um, however, they they have started you know turning the corner. For instance, their Cisco SDM utility that they have built into a lot of the uh, new like 2818, the new ISR routers. Uh, it's pretty good. It's it's not bad at all. But CME didn't make the upgrade <laughs> on, uh, on the graphic interface. I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to show you how to turn it on. And you'll probably look at it and go, yeah, yeah, once, once you get it via the command line, meaning once you know ePhone, ePhone DN, and you can do all that from the command line, you'll probably just say, I think I'll not use that. Um, what it is useful for is maybe somebody who just administers phones, like maybe you have an administrator on your network, you don't want to give them access to the Cisco router because they might do damage there, you just want to give them limited access to the graphic interface of CME to add and delete phones and things like that. So here's how it works. Uh, first off, in CME, you have, uh, let me do a, a dir flash real quick. You have all these files that get extracted to Flash, and one of them is a directory, or subdirectory, I should say, called GUI. So if I look in that subdirectory, you can see that we have all these HTML pages and things like that that, that uh, run the GUI itself. So to, uh, to turn on the web server inside of your router and, and give it the ability to serve up web pages, you can use the command IPHTTP server. Now, that turns on the HTTP server, but a lot of people may choose to enable this secure server, which allows you to use HTTPS when you're accessing it through the web page, and, uh, and it will give you encryption. So some people just turn this one off altogether and just use the secure server however you want to do it. It's totally up to you. But one of the things, at least on the newer CME versions, is we need to change the path that it uses for the web pages because the newer CME versions organize uh, the, the flash into subdirectories. The old one would just throw all these files into one big you know, root directory in flash, so you just have like thousands of files, or hundreds of them anyway, uh, that were sitting in flash just unorganized. The new ones allow you to organize them as subdirectories, but you need to tell the web server that. So if you have one of the newer versions of call manager, or CME, you'll have uh, IP HTTP path flash colon forward slash GUI to say, look in the GUI directory to get those files. Last but not least, I need to say IP HTTP authentication local, meaning use the local user database to log people into these web pages. Now we need to configure the telephony service itself. 
Because under the telephony service, we need to enable a few features that allows web administration. The first thing is we need to create a web administrator. So I'm going to say the web admin for the system, and you can see we can create a custom administration which has limited access. But I'm going to say the, for the full system, I'm going to define a user account with the name, and we'll do uh, ninja admin. This will be our secret ninja administrator. And we'll say we can either use password or secret. Uh, password is a clear text version of the password, which you normally don't want in today's world, meaning somebody could do a show running config on your router, and they'll be able to see this password after you type it in. Eh, not good. So normally we'll use the secret on modern routers, which encrypts the password. And I'll say secret zero, which says I'm going to type the password. I'm not going to type an encrypted version. I'm going to type a unencrypted version uh, of the password. Uh, the password will be, let's use the ultra secure Cisco and hit enter. So it creates a web admin. Let me just do a show run of the section telephony service. And when we do that, we'll see that we have this web admin now created Ninja admin with the secret. Notice it now has a five there saying the encrypted password to follow, saying this is the encrypted version of the password. Blah, blah, blah. You know, just a bunch of junk. So that is now the uh, encrypted version and it's, it's good to go. So the last two things that you can type in here if you'd like to is DN web edit. You can see there's no option to it. And time web edit. That allows you to change directory numbers and time, the system time of the router through the web page. You have to enable those individually because those might be considered privileged commands, like you're not usually going to do something like that. So now the last thing to do is access this web page using a web browser. All right, so let me go ahead and enter, open, I should say, Internet Explorer. There we go. And we are in the middle of the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games, which are phenomenal. I've been watching them in the evening. There's some just amazing stuff. They should have a, a Cisco competition on there where they like fastest to configure a Cisco router or something. That'd be awesome. Oh, there we go. I already had it typed in. Uh, to access the CME pages, you go to call manager IP address, HTTP or HTTPS forward slash ccme.html. Very important to include that or else the router thinks you're administering the whole router rather than just specifically uh, CME. So I'll click on that. Pops up my username prompt. I'll say ninja admin. That's my username. Password will be Cisco. Hit enter. And there we go. Here's the GUI. And it's, it's not that bad. Maybe I was a little too hard on the GUI before. You've got your menus, you know, configure extensions or phones, you know, administrative, you can save your router config, very advanced stuff. Um, I'm going to click on configure extensions. Click on that guy. And you can see I've got all my extensions down here that uh, were defined. If I want to add an extension, you can see it pops up. It says, you know, what's your extension number, what sequence number, that's aka ePhone DN number. Right, so I'm kind of translating this into command line. Uh, your call forwarding fields, your labels. So, you know, this isn't this isn't too bad. I mean, if if you have a sub administrator, you can type in the name Bob. You know, <laughs> I don't know why I put Bob in there, but you you know, you can just configure this at intercom, paging, uh, MWI or park slot, what type of DN. So, with some training, you could get a sub administrator. Uh, set up to where they can configure phones using the graphic interface. Uh, you can even go into the system parameters and notice under here you've got uh, the directory service where you can add individually individual directory entries like my hallway B fax we did in the initial productivity features nugget. Uh, we've got the transfer patterns. If we want to set up transfer patterns, uh, you are. I mean, you can you can see these as well as I can. You can just you know click on the pin numbers for after hours pins. All of these different features can be configured through the GUI. So basic. I'll say it's basic. It's not pretty, but it's functional to give you the ability to have some sub administrators working that configure the phones. So that is how we can get the CME uh, GUI phones and and uh you know going and you know i i'm trying i'm trying here right i'm trying to make the gui look great but i i just i like the command line and i think i think 
after this series is done, you'll you'll like the command line better too. So I think I think that's all I had to say. I think yes, that is it. In this nugget, we have gone through intercom, paging, after hours call blocking, all these features, the music on hold, and the CME GUI to get that up and running on your router. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.